Okay, so basketball has a major history of cheating. Baseball clearly has some absurd moments of cheating as well, but football? The final member of the holy trinity of American sports is completely clean, right? And outside of maybe one rogue Belichick, when has there ever been any cheating problems in the NFL? <sighs> Where do I even start? Well, it turns out there's been more than a few shenanigans going on behind the scenes in the NFL, but above all the shady business, one singular substance took the NFL by storm, was passed around the entire league, got banned, and somehow still remained very popular. And to this day, that particular substance just might be the secret your favorite NFL star is hiding. So without further ado, we got a wild one today. So I guess join me and let's uncover the true story behind easily the largest cheating scandal in NFL history. So, stick em. Uh, what is it? Well, according to Oxford scholars, it is available in powder, paste, and aerosol spray forms, and the spray form helps improve grip even in wet conditions. So imagine it's the NFL in the 1970s. Guys are literally doing coke in between plays, and because the NFL as we know it had just been established, basic rules to prevent on-field advantages had yet to be completely refined. Now to exploit the uh, lack of rules here, allow me to introduce you to the protagonist of our story, Raiders Hall of Fame wide receiver, Fred Bolitnikoff, the second most attractive player in NFL history. And from the late 60s to the early 70s, Fred Bolitnikoff was just about the best wide receiver the NFL had to offer, as during his golden years from 1967 to 1972, he was practically invincible, racking up 319 receptions for 5,249 yards and 46 touchdowns, ranking top two among his peers in all major receiving categories. Also, more importantly, Fred Bolitnikoff was praised for having a special quality to him, as he seemed to take a hardcore, perfectionist approach towards catching footballs. And if somehow he were to ever drop a singular football, then Bruce Lee in the flesh would take over his body and soul and he would go on a kicking rampage. But I bet you can guess where at least a majority of his uh, catching expertise came from, because before pretty much every practice, game, and late night clubbing adventure, he would never ever be caught without a healthy dose of stickum on his entire body. And it's very important to know that at this time in the NFL, stickum had never even been seen before. And although there were other notable stickum users in the late 60s and 70s after him, Fred Bolitnikoff was the creator of everything and unknowingly changed the trajectory of NFL history forever. All right, so Fred Bolitnikoff used stickum, whatever. He put on a little bit of glue before each and every game, but who really cares, right? What's the big deal? Uh, well, it turns out there are actually a few problems here. For one thing, this stickum substance isn't just effective for catching footballs. Anything and everything that comes in contact with stickum instantly gets coated in the glue, including the ball, the player's hands, and even their skin. So this yellow glue stuff was heavy duty material. But of course, no price is too great in pursuit of a competitive advantage because not only did Bolitnikov put stickum on his hands during the pregame, but the man kept a full load of stickum in his socks at all times so that in between plays he could reach into his well of honey and reload on glue whenever he needed it. And unfortunately for the NFL, this stickum strategy was really working as Bolitnikov continued to dominate even into almost the 1980s. As in 1977, the Raiders beat the Vikings in Super Bowl XI, and Fred Bolitnikov took home the Super Bowl MVP award while coated in stickum as usual. But in that very season where the Raiders would go on to win the Super Bowl, Fred Bolitnikov made one small decision that would change NFL history forever. During the first preseason game of the 1977 NFL season, a rookie named Lester Hayes was just a guy looking to keep a roster spot. That's when Freddy came walking by on the sidelines and passed Lester a glob of stickum, and with this move, the torch had been passed. So, allow me to introduce you to the second piece of this puzzle, Lester Hayes. 
the Raiders All-Pro defensive back. You see, here's the problem with Lester Hayes using Stickham. Because not only does he have to catch passes like Fred Bolitnikoff, but as a cornerback, Stickham is actually pretty effective for pressing receivers off the line. And it also should be known that around this time, Stickham was gaining popularity around the league, but players were just using a little glue on their hands at most. Whereas... Lester Hayes, the man nicknamed Lester the Molester, absolutely lathered himself in Stickum before every game. I mean, he came out onto the field looking more like a wax sculpture than a human being. And just like with his teammates, Stickum had proven to provide nothing but winning results. As Lester Hayes was arguably the best defensive player ever in 1980, as he made an all-pro team, won the Defensive Player of the Year award, and logged an outrageous 13 interceptions, the most interceptions in a single season ever since 1953. And in this 1980 season, I believe the tipping point for Stickham happened as Lester Hayes basically won an entire game by himself using Stickham as his primary weapon. With seconds left in the wild card against the Houston Oilers after a timeout, Lester Hayes went to the sidelines, grabbed a glob of Stickham, came back onto the field, and just smeared it all over over the ball in front of the Oilers. And they couldn't do anything about it because Stickham was completely legal at the time. So with literal glue on the ball, Houston probably had a rough time snapping the ball and a low snap led to a Raiders block, keeping the Oilers from getting a free field goal. So after the Raiders would go on to win the Super Bowl in 1980, with guys like Lester Hayes taking things too far and straight up bathing in the glue, players weren't even trying to hide the Stickham use anymore, and ahead of the 1981 season, the NFL created the Lester Hayes rule outright banning Stickham forever. And I wish I could have just ended the video here and we could have cemented Stickham's legacy as this fun little novelty thing in the 70s and 80s, but um, if that were true, then why in the hell did Jerry Rice, one of the best players in NFL history, admit fully to using Stickum throughout his entire career and claimed that everyone did it? So stay strapped in because somehow this rabbit hole just keeps getting deeper. Now we need to fast forward to the year 2012, and up to this point, Stickham had pretty much been virtually extinct in the league. And with full body checks of players before games and during halftime to prevent enhancements, it became pretty much impossible to ever get away with having a mound of glue on your hands. So for the longest time, nobody was caught until the Chargers finally uh, slipped up. So here we are in 2012, it's week six, and the Chargers are playing the Broncos in a very routine divisional matchup. Phillip Rivers and the Chargers were balling out. They took a 24 to zero lead over Denver and then poof. 35 unanswered points, and they blew the lead completely. I mean, you know the drill at this point, right? But in the middle of the game, the Chargers deployed a very sneaky tactic to get around the pregame and halftime checks as in-between timeouts. Their equipment managers were passing around a towel that was laced with a very familiar dark yellow tinted glue. Except the Chargers couldn't even cheat right, as a line judge actually caught them handing out these suspicious towels, and after not complying with the officials and trying to hide the evidence, the refs eventually confiscated the towels and opened an investigation on the Chargers facility. But interestingly enough, the investigation only warranted a $20,000 fine, and that was for not immediately complying with an official, and the creators of this sticky towel actually came to the defense of the Chargers, saying, I can ensure the Chargers weren't the first and they weren't the only NFL team with players using it. It's used on the the field, the sidelines, even the training rooms. But the NFL did everything they could to cover this up and acted like nobody was using Stickum and all it was was a relic of the past. But uh, <laughs> then the bombshell was dropped. On an interview regarding gloves in the modern NFL, Jerry Rice went on the air and said this. I know this might be a little illegal, guys. I just put a little spray, a little Stickum on them, you know, just to make sure that texture is uh, a little sticky. What? A little illegal? Jerry, well, well, why would you ever admit to doing this? 
what do you have to gain? And here's where some big problems for the NFL began, as this Jerry Rice segment on the documentary would be released on January 17th of 2015. And on January 18th of 2015, just one day later, the Patriots would take the field against the Indianapolis Colts and also uh, seem to use some under-the-table tactics to gain an advantage. So, you know, Jerry was getting a lot of unneeded attention, and just like the Chargers, if Jerry Rice was going to go down, he was going to go down swigging, as he basically said that every wide receiver used Stick'em, even after it was banned, and he even backtracked his statement saying, what, uh, what are you guys talking about? When did I ever say that I used Stick'em? I would never. And of course, you then had wide receiver legends like Chris Carter and Michael Irving not too happy with Jerry trying to drag them down with him, as they were very adamant about them not using Stick'em at all. Chris Carter basically just went on Twitter and said that his hands were sculpted by the gods, and Michael Irving, uh, <laughs> well... He decided to use a murder analogy, saying, you know damn well I didn't murder anybody, and, um, uh, well, poor choice of words is all I'll say. But in the modern NFL today, one that is far removed from the use of stick'em, I just have one lingering question. And after I play a few clips for you right now, let's see if you can come up to the same conclusion that I did. Intercepted! On these, oh, there's a flat! Steps up, first downfield shot, jump up! If Stick'em was banned in 1981, then how in the hell do human beings extend just a few fingers and are able to catch a leather football flying them at 60 miles per hour? I mean, there's gotta be something going on, right? Well, yeah, it turns out there is, and uh, this is where things get a little bit tricky. So here's a pair of gloves worn in the 1990s by a guy named Deion Sanders. You know, pretty solid all-around football player, whatever, you get the idea. But just look at these gloves. There is no grip to them whatsoever, and they're just plain bulky. I mean, they look more like hockey gloves than traditional football ones. And here's a photo of Odell Beckham's gloves when he was on the Giants in the 2010s. These gloves are much sleeker, more compact, and more importantly, are coated in a smooth, sticky substance that if a player were caught using these back in the day, they probably would have been labeled as a cheater. Now, if we remember back to the 70s and 80s, NFL gloves back then were pretty much just for keeping players' hands warm, and because of the less strict stick'em rules, players didn't even consider modifying their gloves to make it easier to catch. But in 1995, everything changed when the final piece to this puzzle, a college receiver named Jeff Beresnik got his hands on a pair of glass cutter gloves and saw the untapped potential in them. Jeff then did everything he could to perfect the formula for a flawless glove, spending the next 18 months perfecting the sticky formula until eventually he had done it. But although all of this is great, this begs to ask the question, how the hell are these modern gloves even legal? And well, the answer is through a technical loophole in the NFL rulebook, because Stick'em was only banned because of the residue that it left on the ball affecting all players. Whereas the new silicone gloves leave no trace on the ball whatsoever, thus making them legal. And similarly to less strict traveling rules in the NBA, the NFL has seemingly followed suit, choosing entertainment value value over what's, I guess, morally correct in football terms, and I mean, fair enough, who doesn't want to see more catches like these? So gaining an advantage in the NFL used to be easy and legal, until the substances that made it easy were banned and players had to get a little creative, and now we're at a point where cheating is basically widely accepted, and all we're left with is a bunch of old guys pointing fingers and some sick ass catches. Anyways, if you like this video, then subscribe, because I got a lot of videos on the channel just like this one, and if you like this video, then watch this video right here, where I watched every single Super Bowl, and basically told you what I learned. It's pretty good, trust me. Anyways, until next time.